Hey everybody! Okay, this is the third and final leg of the humor series. We're going to do this as essentially an audio upload, though there are a few visual things that I think are pretty cool, which I'll put on screen when it's appropriate, and I'll mention it when I do. Okay, here we're going to talk about some very cool things, like how to use the idea we've introduced in the last two videos to improve jokes, how this idea fits in with all the different sayings we have about humor, and we're going to talk about what it shows us about ourselves, including some stuff that actually has been confirmed later by a neuroscience study, which is cool. And I'm going to show a couple ways to visualize the idea, which might be weird, but interesting. Alright, so, before we talked about the different factors that make something funny. To restate it, it's how high your expectations are, how much lower the thing you observe is, how noticeable and believable it is, and how low your anxiety is. Now, that's several things to take in, and I didn't actually show a graphic to make it clearer. That's what we're going to do here, and it's extra helpful because in a lot of the cases where you talk about things like this, you can get to see a lot of variables, but you can't really use them unless you have a way of seeing how they relate to each other. So, we have that. And basically to do it, we'll use a different way of looking at it. For an example of what I mean, last year there was a lot of news about a study that came out showing supposedly an equation for happiness. And that looks like this. I'm going to put it up on screen. I'm not going to try to read that. I don't have the slightest clue what it says. But apparently it produces very accurate predictions when people play certain games where they can keep what they have or try to get more. And in a much clearer form, we can do something similar here. This is what it looks like, and I'm putting it on the screen. Now, what I like about it, even though you can't necessarily assign exact measurements or anything to this, is that it lets you say a lot in a very small amount of space about how things relate to each other. Like you can see here in this ego and knowledge graphic. So, okay, I'll read our little equation out loud. How humorous someone finds something is going to be equivalent to the difference between the qualities they expected to see or hear and the level of quality they actually saw or heard multiplied by how noticeable it is, by how valid or believable it is, and the whole thing is divided by the level of anxiety the person feels. And that's it. Now, this lets us show a lot of things. The difference in the qualities you expected to see, and we're going to talk about more examples here, and what you actually saw means that a very high expectation makes something funnier. Or, seeing something very bad makes it funnier. And, if you can't notice it, or you don't believe it, either one of those, n or v, will be zero. And if you know your multiplication, that means the whole top becomes zero. And then, the whole result will be zero. The bottom says that the whole thing can be increased or decreased depending on how much anxiety you feel. If your anxiety is too high, you won't find anything funny. Which makes sense because laughter is a sort of knee-jerk response that makes noise. You don't want to be doing that if you're trying to avoid a lion or something or someone else that's threatening you. So that's the general thing. Now let's show how this actually applies in the real world. How it can explain a lot of things we observe or have said about humor. Hopefully in a clear way. If you actually clicked on this video, I think you'll find it very interesting. First. Qualities expected. It's qualities instead of quality because the whole thing layers, like we showed briefly in the second video. If you see Segway fails, it makes not only the person falling off the Segway look bad, it actually makes the Segway itself look dangerous, which makes the people who manufacture Segways look bad. So those are funnier than just a simple fall. On top of that, the more normal something is, the less commonly we see it go wrong, the stronger that makes our expectation that it will go right. So the saying, I didn't see that coming, which is very common with humor, means exactly that you had a very high expected quality. Along the same lines, if you don't have any expected quality, you won't find something funny. When we typically have characters who are very geeky or odd or logically minded, we usually see them as having no sense of humor either. This is reflected in what we're talking about here. Because typically, people with those types of minds don't have a model for what other people should and shouldn't know in normal courses of events. They don't know what a social mistake is or how other people think. But since those people don't have any expected quality from normal people, they don't laugh when normal people make mistakes. This is also why they will give 
normal answers to sarcastic questions, as though the person seriously wanted to know whether the sun would come up tomorrow or whatever they might ask. But when you move into something the person does know, you'll find that they do in fact have a sense of humor. In the same way that Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory might burst out laughing at people who ask the most innocent question about math or physics. He has an expectation of what you should know because he finds it easy. And thus, there you will see that he can laugh, and laugh quite a bit. Okay, next. The level of wrongness, or low quality, that you see can make for a big difference in this part too. When we talk about absurdity in humor, or the saying, it's just so wrong, that's what we mean. And of course, whether you fall a little bit or fall flat on your face, that matters too in this case. Now, when you don't see a difference between what you expect and what you observe, something isn't funny. Check out this clip from the Joe Rogan podcast, where Eddie Bravo, who is a black belt in jiu-jitsu, is talking about sparring with students as compared to sparring with his mentor, who is a master of the art. When me and Jean-Jacques wrestle, we are always talking smack to each other. I don't like to do it too much to my students because then it seems like I'm acting all arrogant against a guy that I could, right. he's one of my students, he's a blue belt or a white belt. Right. I'm not, that would look really douchey. No, but you seem, do it playful. But because Jean-Jacques can smash me anytime he wants, I talk, uh, I, like I pretend like I'm arrogant because it's funny. So bullying is not funny since, among other things, there's no violation of the quality that people expect. The bully takes advantage of already being stronger than the victim. For it to be funny, there has to be something about it that goes against the qualities we already expect. If we already think someone is clumsy, they have to do something even clumsier to go lower. They can't just fulfill our brain's expectation. In this case, Eddie Bravo acting like he's better than Jean-Jacques Machado is a mistake he'd be showing, since Jean-Jacques is in fact a master of the sport. Of course, though, we're not going to laugh at something if we don't realize it's there. The thing has to be in front of our face or otherwise noticeable for us. And when we do notice it, the laughter happens automatically. This is why we say, if you have to explain a joke, it's not funny. It means that the joke didn't make the error noticeable enough for people's brains to pick up on it and thus laugh. And we only do laugh at it when our own brain picks up on it. This is also why we say, um, brevity is the soul of wit. Most of the action in a good joke takes place in the mind of the listener. They make the connection. So normally a good joke doesn't spend or take too much time or explanation when the punchline comes. Likewise, because laughing at a joke indicates that the audience themselves sees the error, we have the saying that ridicule is man's most potent weapon. You don't need to convince an audience that a person is a fool if you can make them laugh at something the person did. It means they already noticed it themselves. That's also why it's hard to argue against ridicule. The mere existence of the laughter means that the message was already sent, and all you can do as the target is try to clean up afterward, usually with little success. Now, having said that, when we do notice something like someone falling or failing, we will indeed laugh if it's a more awkward fall or a bigger fail but not just any awkward fall or fail. Our brain has to, to some degree, think it was real. This is validity. When we say things like this from The Simpsons, Technically, it's true. That's what makes it so funny. That's what we mean. And Muhammad Ali has a famous quote, My way of joking is to tell the truth. That's the funniest joke in the world. Which, of course, refers to this same thing. Now, another thing about this, the brain checks whether something is real in this case, using its experiences in the real world, but it also uses another method that is more simplistic. It looks to see whether the new thing, which doesn't match in some specific way, matches in other ways. Like if I showed you an apple, an orange, a grapefruit, a tangerine, and then a basketball, that might be funny. The basketball is round like the others, but isn't a fruit. See, it matches in some ways, but not others. The closer it matches in those ways, along with the more it's missing in those other ways, the funnier it will be. The key thing here is that the brain is looking for a simple error in a pattern. Now, here's what's really interesting about this. If humor does come from the earliest parts of our brain and has served as a simple way for us to identify failures of intelligence, it means that the brain used to use a simpler model of thinking. 
simply putting together ABC forms of cause and effect, like pick up the stick, hit the branch, and the fruit will fall. And thus, recognizing when that ABC isn't properly followed was how it originally determined whose brain worked well or not well. I noted this in the original papers I put up, but didn't think much else of it at the time. You know, I'm not an anthropologist or neuroscientist, so I figured it probably a standard knowledge there. But it turned out later, I don't remember how, but I saw that an article had popped up in Harvard Magazine a few weeks after my papers. It's called, Was the Human Brain Unleashed? You can Google it up now and I'll put it on screen. They did a detailed study with MRI machines on people, and they found a conclusion which I'll read. The neurons in the sensory and motor areas seem to be playing a game of telephone in which information follows serial paths. The cells in the association areas use a communication strategy more like the internet, with lots of simultaneous connections and pathways. Buckner and Krynan looked for a simple way to explain this phenomenon. Association areas not only evolved later in humans, they also form later in an individual's development. So, if we look at our own paper here, by the reverse engineering we did from what makes us laugh, it turns out we actually anticipated the results of this study, which is pretty cool, and I think should, in some way, give some credibility to what we're talking about. Okay, now, the bottom part of our little equation. Anxiety which has a huge effect on how funny we'll find things by itself. When we talk about it being, quote, too soon to make a joke, like after a tragedy, It's been over a year, guys. I declare the tsunami's now funny. This is exactly what we're referring to. We still have anxiety associated with the event, so we don't enjoy any jokes about it. We could also take the fact that someone else is joking about it as offensive, since it would indicate that the person feels low anxiety themselves when they shouldn't. Likewise, when we see characters like the Joker laugh at horrific things, it indicates that they're insane exactly because it shows that they don't feel anxiety about those awful things. Along the same lines, we often might say, I was in a silly mood, when we find ourselves laughing at strange things. This generally refers to our anxiety being extremely low, usually as a result of having already laughed at something else. And, of course, laughing at one thing can make us start looking for other funny things in the same situation. So you combine both of those to see that continuing laughter is more likely. But this brings us to something else interesting. Because if what we're saying here is true, then it might follow that anything that unnaturally lowers your anxiety would also make you find things funnier. And it turns out that we do see that. Nitrous oxide, which the dentist gives you to help deal with your treatment, in one way by lowering your natural anxiety, is known as laughing gas. It makes you laugh at all kinds of things. Perhaps similarly, when people get angry and we say, I'm just joking, it indicates that we ourselves don't feel much anxiety about what we're saying. And also, I think it underlines the idea that this would be for peaceful social organization, there being no physical threat involved. On the other side, sometimes people feel uncommonly high amounts of anxiety about something. This is where I think the classic idea of someone being a stick in the mud comes from. For example, in the movie Animal House, which is set at a college, the dean refuses to laugh at any of the main characters' jokes because they're failing their classes. To the dean, flunking out of school is a serious situation. He associates a lot of anxiety with that, so he doesn't laugh about them fooling around and messing up their education. Likewise, if someone has high anxiety related to social interaction, or errors in general, they also will come off like a stick in the mud. By the same token, this also plays a key role in how humor functions in movies. We often associate comedy films with being light entertainment, things we don't take too seriously. And comedians also often struggle to have people view them seriously. The key to that is this same idea, that humor requires us to have low anxiety, which means that a humorous scene in a movie, if it works, will automatically lower the level of tension and thus interest we have in what's going on. Since that anxiety about the fate of the characters, how things will turn out and so on, is a key part of creating deeper interest and delivering more powerful emotions, especially because that tension has to build over time. So there's a sort of conflict in how our mental circuitry works that often prevents comedic scenes in movies 
from also generating some of the more powerful experiences that we can have. Now moving on, you generally will see very few sticks in the mud when it comes to babies and toddlers. They haven't developed a lot of the awareness that might lead to it. And as a result of that same thing, we tend to find them especially funny since basically everything they do has high validity. A mistake a toddler makes is their own genuine attempt at doing something. And when toddlers laugh, it's very often at poo-poo and other humor related to butts. In psychology, there's a lot of theories about that. For our purposes, I think it's easiest to just say that the most wrong or gross thing that toddlers know about is pooing. So when they look for things that are errors or of low value, it's the example that leaps the fastest to their young minds. And when they're even younger than that, they tend to like peekaboo because they're still learning about object permanence. One of the first logical rules they start to understand is that things don't disappear and reappear. So when you do it by covering your face, you're doing something wrong to them, which makes for one of the first things they'll laugh at. It also is something that I think could be used to test or help understand how much water this concept holds. It predicts, basically, that babies will find things funny at different points in their development, as they start to recognize different patterns or rules about existence in people. If I was ever able to conduct a study on it, it would probably revolve around that. Or, when I get the chance, I can look more into the developmental stages and see how they align with what babies find funny at different points. Likewise, if something seems childish, we as adults or older people might pick up on that and see it as a sign of low quality. A good example would be funny songs, like for example this one, Brody Quest. The upbeatness of the song, the energy of it, can seem over-eager and immature. And if you listen to more of it, the individual instruments themselves kind of interrupt each other. Like they are too eager to please, or that they are slightly out of whack with each other and not performing well. So, without any words or anything to see, it hopefully shows that we can still notice things in other ways that can make us laugh. Anyway, the point about what makes people laugh at different ages should also underline how each humor reaction is unique to the individual listener, and helps us understand what a person's sense of humor actually consists of. Namely, what they consider to be of high quality, what they find to be of low quality, what types of things they're able to notice, what they'll find believable, and what kinds of things give them anxiety. As a quick demonstration, I think the English sense of humor, like Monty Python, depends largely on English people being raised to expect certain things from people with certain regional English accents, which makes goofy behavior by those people even funnier, while people in the United States in many cases won't notice. Okay, now, with that overall concept in mind, and having seen the equation, there's actually another way to look at it. And this is a chance to take a look at something that might be pretty weird, but also, I think, pretty cool. Because you can represent that same relationship among those things with a graph. Depending on how you look at it, you could even say it's a three-dimensional or even a four-dimensional graph. I don't know what the conventions are of making graphs. I don't know if you can even do this, but here's what it is. Now, you can probably see all the same variables. The qualities expected are the top bar. The qualities detected are the bottom bar and the amount of humor you feel in something is represented by the difference between the two bars. Quality expected can go up or down, increasing or decreasing the humor. Quality detected can go up or down also, increasing or decreasing the humor. But on top of that, how visible the bars are is represented by the noticeability. If that hits zero, you no longer have bars to measure. You could phrase it in terms of the individual noticeability of the quality expected or detected, but that might be too complicated for now. Let's just say at the moment that a zero there gives you no difference and no humor. Now, on top of that, we represent the other two variables, the validity of it and the anxiety you feel, with a magnifier. I know it's weird, but if you feel the thing is very believable and you don't feel too much anxiety, then that number goes up to represent that, and it changes the size of the bars and increases the distance between them. So that's a visual way to understand it. Like I said, I don't even know if that's an acceptable way to use a graph. And in terms of the math, someone could troll by asking what happens if anxiety is zero, does it become undefined? And uh, we could just ignore that question. 
or declare that you always have some baseline level of anxiety, whatever makes it work. The bottom line is that I think it's useful and could be used to make predictions about what people will find funny, if you can do brain scans or find some other way to estimate what the values are. Okay, and that brings us to our last few things. First of all, how useful is all this stuff? Well, one of the tests that's been proposed of a theory about humor, and of any theory really, is how you can apply it. And we can use this to fix jokes. I'll do a quick example. There's a bad joke which actually won a bad joke contest that I once heard about, which is, what kind of beans do animals like? Human beans. With this idea, we can understand why this joke is so bad. It's supposed to be a setup for a pun, which means we need to detect misplacement. But we don't really sense any. Mainly because you don't sense any pattern in the first place that's being broken. Most animals don't like people or eat people. And on top of that, there's nothing low quality layered with it. Human beans is a misplacement of a word, but there's nothing foolish or bad about a bean or being human. So you could only notice that one thing in the first place, and the one thing doesn't work. So how can we make it better? Well, we look at our factors, in this case, we can raise the expectation by making it closer to a known pattern. Animals aren't fully associated with liking or eating anything related to people. But is there a group that is? Yes, cannibals. Cannibals are known specifically for what they eat. And is there a food that sounds like a body part that we could throw in? Yeah, kidney beans. So if you raised someone's expectation by asking them as honestly as you could make it sound, hey, did you know that cannibals actually eat beans? Then said, yeah, kidney beans. You might be able to get a real laugh out of them. And all right, lastly, based on what we're saying in terms of this having an origin in people's social groups, it would naturally follow that some other animals who can control their breathing and have social orders would develop laughter too. Well, if you check into it, it turns out that they do. Both apes and dogs have their own forms of laughter with its own unique sound. This was covered on Discovery.com and Psychology Today. Apes' humor is based more on physical failures, naturally, and dogs' humor is based on their own forms of play, and is also shown to have anxiety-reducing effects for them. And that's it. That covers most of what I wanted to touch on, really, in regards to this theory, and the various ways it can work and be represented. I hope you enjoyed this video series, and see you soon.